So how did you first get involved in this petition for a women's Tour de France? Well, Todd, the petition really came about through the film, Half the Road, which we made on the, the movement in women's cycling, the equality, and the push for you know, recognition within pro cycling. And after I'd been interviewing a bunch of these amazing women, you know, Mariana Vos, Emma Pooley, top racers in the U.S., uh, you know, I started to understand that so many of us were like-minded on this subject, and especially Emma Pooley. So she and I were talking about, you know, what we can do in terms of, of getting more equality and parity in the, in the cycling world, specifically the Tour de France. And I said, look, why don't we think about starting a petition so that ASO could just see how many people really would be excited to see a women's tour. And, you know, maybe they just don't realize how many people are out there that would tune in. So the idea behind the petition was not just to gain signatures, but also to create a business plan and to show how a working model of a women's race at the tour would create, you know, sustainability. And so that's what we did. So uh, myself and Emma Pooley and Mariana Vos and Chrissy Wellington, uh, we got together, we drafted a petition, and we sent it out last year on um, July 11th. And within the first two days, we had 10,000 signatures, and within three weeks, we had 97,000 signatures worldwide of people that wanted to tune in and see a women's tour de France. And so you obviously had a great reception from the public that was behind this idea, but then you took it to the ASO, the Amore Sports Organization, the organization that owns and runs the Tour de France, how did they receive the idea of this? Well, I think at first they they weren't so thrilled with the idea of a petition. You know, petition technically has some negative connotations to it often, but we saw it as positive change. So uh, I think at first they were they were a little bit annoyed at the at the petition, but yeah. underneath that they really truly understood that okay, we understand now that women and not just women, but people are calling for this. And so maybe we should think about creating a women's race. What was the process like from starting the petition to getting the actual race? Oh, okay, so that was a that was a big year. Really, we started the petition last July. And, you know, as I mentioned, it wasn't just the petition itself and getting signatures, but what was behind it. You know, the website with the manifesto of how to create this change and how to create a model moving forward, you know, that would, would be sustainable in the sport. So that was a lot of work, a lot of manpower, many hours, Skype calls with all of us being, you know, international. Uh, and then, of course, working with ASO to really explain the ins and outs of the women's side of the sport and what venues or what ideas might be best. So, I mean, we were talking a, you know, a full on year of working behind the scenes and a lot of it, you know, was, was confidential too. So we couldn't be really vocal at the time, you know, in public. And um, so we, you know, on our Twitter accounts or Facebook, we would say, well, working hard behind the scenes, you know, and really having all of these hurdles to, to overcome. But um, it was it was amazing. So in uh, January of 2014, very end of January, early February, ASO announced that they would hold the one day women's race this year uh, called La Course. And uh, since then and during then, we've been involved a little bit with that process of, you know, what the race might look like or how many teams might be invited and the structure of it. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a year, full on from the petition until, until now. And so was that really your mission accomplished to get the one day race or did you actually have expectations for more this year? That's a great question. Honestly, we, we petitioned for a three week tour de France, uh, knowing that, okay, in one year's time, that would be very logistically difficult. Uh, and even the sustainability of creating that would be, would be really difficult in one year. But we also knew that that's something that we want to work toward. And we really want that three week stage race to come to fruition in time. But we were very happy to get our foot in the door and have a one day race created for 2014. ASO, they could have said, you know what? Yeah, we'll think about it. We'll get to it. Maybe we'll see something in 2016, 2017. But they took the initiative and said, no, let's do it now. Let's get it started. So while there are people out there that say, oh, you only have one day, you know, we look at it as, no, that's our starting block. We have one day this year and we'll move forward from there. Well, there's certainly been a ton of buzz and interest about this race from a wide variety of people around the world. And I've had a lot of good feedback. I'm very excited. How do you get from here one day to your goal of three weeks? Okay, so a lot of that revolves around the public. You know, if, if the public tunes in and watches this race and grasps the exciting concept of women's racing, then that creates the demand. And, and ASO will see that, and not just ASO, but every race organizer will see that 
the drive behind women's cycling. And the more people that tune in, you know, that counts as TV hits, web hits, liking, sharing, you know, tweeting, all of these social media aspects will show that demand. And that's where the public really has a huge part in our future for this sport. So that can, that can, you know, start the initiation of, oh, okay, well, one day went well, let's add three days next year and maybe five or 10 the next. So we really put the power out there to the people saying, if this is something you want to see, you know, created, then you have the power to help make this happen. So how involved were you, Mariano Vos and Emma Pooley in planning this year's race with the ASO, the organizers of the Tour de France? We were lucky to be quite involved with that. Uh, the first meeting that we had with ASO, it was, it was actually really interesting from, from our perspective. Mariana and I were both at the World Championships in Florence last year. Emma had taken a year off to finish her PhD. Uh, Chrissy was doing all sorts of things related to the triathlon industry. And we, along with uh, four others that are involved with La Tour Antier, our, our movement, we, um, we left world championships and went to Paris, you know, kind of on an overnight train or, or planes, you know, to get there and to meet with them and to really make it happen. I mean, Mariana and her family, they drove from Florence to Paris overnight to sit in on this meeting and make sure that we could be involved and help guide ASO in any questions that they might have about, about you know, really sustaining this model for, for women's cycling. So what was that meeting like when you got all those people together? Were you all sitting around a table together? Yeah, we were all, <laughs> we were all sitting around a table together. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm in the greatest company possible. This is amazing. You know, these Olympic gold medalists and world champions. And, you know, and then there's me. <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, hopefully if there's anything that I, I could have shown or given to that, it's that maybe, you know, change can come from everybody and it can come from all ideas, you know, it doesn't always have to be a world champion or an Olympian. Like, we're all capable of creating change. So, you know, if, if I played any small part in that, maybe that was that was something. But uh, it was it was really amazing to be there in that room and to sit down with Christian and Prudhomme and, uh, you know, the head of ASO and all sorts of people that were instrumental in bringing this about. And I think that's what matters. When you can get in front of somebody face to face and they actually see your passion for the sport, and your drive and your willingness to create this change, you know, that's that's kind of when the magic happens. So if you hadn't had that meeting, would we have La Course? No, I don't. <laughs> well, not, not this quickly. I wow. don't think we would have had it uh, come around this quickly. And again, it's it's the power of, you know, the influence that was in that room and the, the amazing people that were behind that, you know, uh, that petition and that's really what I think drove it was sitting down face to face with the people that really wanted to see it and make it happen. So what did you all accomplish on that one pivotal day then? I think, I think that what we accomplished by sitting down with them was showing our intent and our seriousness that we will do whatever it takes to make this Tour de France happen for women, not just not just this coming year, but all future years, and that we want to work together. So I think that was the biggest thing. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, whether it's a petition or somebody looking for change, they want somebody else to make that change happen. They want to say, you make a tour to France and, you know, we'll give you a thumbs up. But really what we wanted was to say, let us help you make this together. And let's be, you know, uh, partners moving forward in, in making this work. So I think that's something maybe that we all got out of it was, you know, the power of, of persuasion in its truest form and being able to sit there and have a back and forth discussion. Beginning in 1984, the women actually had their own Tour de France backed by the organizers of the men's race, the ASO, 84 through 89. And then there was a bit of a change of the reins and they stopped promoting the race and uh, some other people and organizations put the race on through uh, 2009. But uh, now we have a new situation, we ha we're back, it's a one day race. What makes it different now than then for you? Well, I think one of the big key components in this race is, you know, back in, in 89, Tour de France no longer allowed the women's race to use the name Tour de France. And so it went to these, uh, you know, different race organizations or different forms of distance or where the race was held. And everything was different. It wasn't the Tour de France for women. And now this year, you know, 25 years later, what makes it so different is that we are able to call it La Course by 
the Tour de France, which is huge. So now we have the name back and we also have the added benefit of social media and everything that's going on now. People can see this worldwide, which we didn't have in the 80s, unfortunately. So this is a huge step forward in terms of the social movement. There's a new president of the UCI, Brian Cookson. Yeah. And he has vocally been much more supportive of women's racing than the UCI president has been in the past. So do you see that as making a big difference as well? I definitely see it as a step forward, of course. You know, and Cookson took office just last fall in 2013. So we, uh, we're still in the infancy of his presidency. So I know a lot of us, we hear, we hear the words that, yes, he's behind women's cycling, and we do see some changes that are coming. And we just want to make sure that that you know, train keeps moving in the right direction. So, uh, you know, Cookson did have a lot of damage control to do coming out of the Verbruggen and the McQuaid administrations. So he's got a lot to shoulder, but, uh, you know, and we're also keeping the pressure on him. So we hope that this is the generation that turns everything around for women cycling. And, you know, and if it doesn't, then we'll be very vocal until it does. And similarly, the ASO is a family owned business. There's a new president because the former president has passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, he couldn't live on forever. <laughs> but do you see any differences within that organization that you think will make La Course more sustainable this time around? I have to say that any time an organization embraces change the way that ASO has done with you know, evolving and creating this La Course for women, that's a great sign and a great step forward. So I would say we're definitely on track there. What about the future of this race? Where do you want to see the okay. women's tour go? Absolutely. That's such a great question because, to be honest, uh, the there's always a catch-22. When you create something like, say, a women's one-day event, there is the possibility that people can say, whew, okay, we've got one day, we've created change, we're all good. But the reality is that this is the time we need to keep the pressure on the most because it's not just about creating change, it's about building upon that change. So we want to make sure that, you know, year one, we have one day, and then the next year, we have more than that, and then more than that, so that we can build forward toward that vision of really showing what women can do in an endurance race such as three weeks. So, you know, we have to keep the pressure on. We have to celebrate this. We have to celebrate the course and celebrate what we've gained. But we also have to make sure that we remain vocal and active so that the change progresses. So you've created the change. That's that's a big first step. But how are you actually, do you think you're going to get that three weeks when there's never been a woman's race that long? And you have a lot of hurdles. And so how do you deal with all those? Well, I'm basically just not going to shut up. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. And I know that we have a lot of people behind us. You're right, though. In terms of the hurdles, we have, um, you know, the logistics that are behind the structure are very important. For example, um, women don't make the same salaries as men. And it, it's nearly impossible for us to go out and train seven or eight hours a day if we also have to hold down a part-time job or, or full-time job, you know, on top of that. So there has to be some structure that allows us to actually go out and train at the same level. Uh, can we do that physiologically? Absolutely, hands down. In fact, we might have a gender advantage at that distance. And that's what, something that the physiologists have proved. So that's fantastic. But, you know, in terms of moving toward that three-week structure, we need, and we also need the sponsors to come in and say, hey, this is great. You know, I saw the Tour de France on Universal Sports. How do I get involved with the women's side? And once we have that, that, uh, you know, that cycle complete of the sponsors getting on board, the media getting on board, and the women being afforded, you know, a sustainable salary, those things have to come into place in order for a three-week tour to sustain itself. Uh, but we fully believe that that can happen. And honestly, the physiological side, we already got that in the bag. We can do that. So we've got the same prize list for the final day of the men's tour and the one day of the women's tour. That's parity. That's a good thing. Yeah. But I agree, and I've seen over the years, the women's salaries and their budgets are a lot smaller than the men's. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's harder to have depth in the women's peloton. Riders come in and go out quicker because right. they can't make a living. It's not a, a career for very many of them. Sure. And so it seems to me, and I'm, I'm proud that Universal Sports Network is covering the race. I'm glad that you're here and you're a person who has advocated for change in women's cycling. But they all come up together, don't they? They do. You get a little bit more television, more sponsors come in, you get more backing for the riders. They, the teams become deeper and bigger. The competition goes up. And so how many years does that take? 
honestly, that can move very quickly. If we have the change and the power to create this change with creating a, a day at the Tour de France within one year, then we do have the power to make the sustainability happen very quickly. Uh, I, I don't think that it would be you know, off to say that in the next five years, this change can happen. In the next 10 years, absolutely, hands down. But I think that the five-year plan looking forward is very doable in creating those three areas. So it can happen, it will happen, and it needs to be, it needs to come from everybody, and especially UCI as well too, saying, okay, we see the movement and we need to create the change, you know, from the top down, as well as from the grassroots up. Do you like the fact that the women's race at the Tour La Course is the same day as the men's race? Do you think that's a benefit? Oh, it's a huge factor. In fact, that's what we're pushing for. I think if you can share the venue but create you know, the differential in time and distance so that both, both parties, or in this case both genders, can share that stage, then that's what it takes. And it's so doable. It's so doable. If we have to race a, you know, a lesser distance uh, just to fit the time clock, we'll do it. You know? or, or if the men can race a shorter distance to fit the time clock, that's doable too. So absolutely uh, creating both. You know? And we look, to, look at the marathon. You have men and women running at the same time or, not, or close to it. You, know, you can stagger the starts. You have uh, you know, tennis matches. You have all sorts of sports that are taking place in the same venues and sharing those venues. So there's no reason that we can't do that in cycling, you know, and I sometimes hear the criticism of, oh, the women should just go and get their own race at a different time or a different venue. But that would be like telling professional golfers or the WNBA that they had to build their own courts or their own greens. And we don't need to do that. We can all come together and share the same venue and have it be profitable and lucrative for the sponsors and the companies involved. Can you explain from your perspective how you think sharing the same venue, as it were, the Champs-Élysées, yeah. for instance, is um, more cost effective and more beneficial to everybody? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if the camera crews and you know the sponsors and the teams, if they're all in the same location and the logistics of, say, road closures and police that need to you know, enforce these rules, uh, if all of these things are happening in one venue, and then all you have to do to include the women's race is perhaps hire out those contractors for longer periods, say two to three hours more, then it's so much more cost effective than if you had to create the exact same replica but on a different day. Then you're literally looking at two different price you know, variables. But you have them on the same day and you elongate it by a few hours, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's an incremental increase in cost. Right, but then is it really a cost if you're bringing, you know, exposure to the teams and therefore you're bringing in sponsorship that wants to be part of the, you know, the media? So you're going to actually get a, har a higher ROI from doing it that way of having both events on the same day than if you were to have two separate events. La Course is a great start for women's cycling. Where do you want to see the women's sport go overall? I want to see women's cycling follow the same path as women's tennis. You know, back in the 70s and what they've created over the past 40 years is very much doable and a perfect model for women's cycling. Uh, you know, when we turn on the TV and we watch tennis, if the men are playing, we're pretty sure that within a few hours or maybe the next day, the women will play. Same thing with cycling. When we turn on the, the TV and, and men's cycling is taken up the screen, we'll know that within a few hours, women's cycling is going to be broadcast in the same manner. So I really believe that that's where we can go with women's cycling. We can share the stage, we can have the same visibility, and we can bring the sport up to the fact that, you know, people sometimes, as soon as I tell them I'm a, I'm a pro cyclist, uh, they say, oh, they have that for women? I mean, they don't even know that that's out there. And that's where women's tennis was in the 70s. So that's what we want to, you know, get over that hurdle of, of the exposure and have, you know, everyone know that not, not only do we exist, but we are, you know, top notch cyclists and really share the love of that sport moving forward and the visibility of that sport. So that can happen. And how do you grow the overall um, view of mm -hmm. women's and, and awareness of women's sport in, or women's cycling like you just compared it to tennis and these other sports. So what's, what's, the, what's the way to do that? You're the way to do that. I mean, sitting down here in universal sports is the key, you know, and, and media outlets are the key. By, by weighing in and creating a program that is exactly the same as what you're gonna show on the men's side, that's how it's done. And like I said, you know, it's so normal for us to turn on TV and we see women's tennis playing. And 
people know that it's there. It's going to be the same thing for women cycling one day. And it starts now. And it starts because you and Universal Sports are creating that platform for us. Who do you think is the favorite to win the women's race? Well, look, Mariana was on the petition with me. So, you know, and Emma's racing too. So I have to, I have to answer that question very carefully in terms of who I think. All I know is that the winner of that race is going it's going to be the most exciting race that you've ever seen it's not just going to be about the winner but i can assure you that second and third and the rest of the the field are going to be right behind that victory so it's going to be the most exciting race um and i that's the best that i can answer it without uh without playing favorites but that's also the exciting part is I can't pick one because there are so many talented top-notch sprinters. I do think that the race is going to go to a sprinter because of the course. And there are so many women that I can't actually choose one. So imagine that. What are the viewers in America going to see in a women's race for those viewers who have never seen a women's race before? <laughs> I think they're going to be surprised at the speed of the race, I think there's a common misconception that women's sports are maybe slower. And I think they're going to be surprised. And, and they might even think that they're watching a men's race and then see like a lot of ponytails <laughs> that differentiate a little bit. But I think they're going to be surprised at the quality of the racing and how fast this race is going to be. You know, it's, it's two and a half hours or two, sorry, it's two hours, 15 minutes. That is a very different kind of race than, say, a six or seven hour stage for men. Our race is going to be on from the get-go, and it's going to be really, really intense. And I think that's going to help create the viewership. You started 2014 without a pro contract, and you were on a mission to race La Course. Tell me what's happened. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> It's um, so one thing I've really, truly learned this year is that when you fight for everything you want, sometimes you lose everything you have. And it can be it can be a struggle. It can really be, you know, when you put yourself out there and your goals and your dreams, a lot of a lot of things come up that, you know, are obstacles, whether they're they're professional or they're personal. Um, it, it's hard. It's hard fighting for change. And I really wanted to to race this event. But again, you know, um, starting 2014 without a pro contract, I thought uh, it's just not going to happen. Plus, 18 teams are invited. Those teams get six riders. And UCI 1.1 uh, races, of which La Course is ranked, uh, you don't have the ability to guest ride. You'd, you'd actually have to be signed to a roster. Uh, you know, and in, in my case, that means in the middle of the season, being signed to a roster, being something of a rabble rouser, <laughs> still a good bike racer, but also 39. You know, these things don't always <laughs> mesh well <laughs> for creating your dream. Uh, but um, the most amazing thing happened, and it was just, uh, you know, just a few weeks back. Um, but uh, Rochelle Gilmore, uh, who runs the team Wiggle Honda, which is you know, based out of the UK, uh, she actually signed me to the team, Wiggle Honda Pro Cycling, and I'm going to get my dream of racing La Course and staying on a UCI team for the rest of 2014. And I might start crying, so. <laughs> what, uh, you know, what, what was it like when you got that call? I, I kind of had this moment where I just froze, like, this can't be happening. This is happening. Oh my God, this is really happening. You know, one year going from a petition to fall out with other teams to struggling to, you know, to get by and all sorts of life changes. And then all of a sudden, like everything that I'd worked for, um, you know, for the sport, but, you know, also in the back of my mind, really wanting to race it myself. And then you don't have a chance. And then that chance is there. It was the most um, un unbelievable moment. I'm so, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful that Rochelle and Wiggle Honda have given me this opportunity and whether they know it or not, they've kind of pushed my loyalty buttons for life. And, uh, I do anything for that team and anything, you know, for, for having this opportunity. It's, uh, it's a personal fairy tale. I don't know if the rest of the world cares, but for me, it's, uh, it's probably the greatest achievement that I've ever been, you know, able to, to have in, in sport. So I'm really honored. Take me inside your body and your mind and your emotions sitting on the start line 
with the crowd, getting ready for the gun to go off on that day. I've envisioned that since day one, and maybe that's something that's, that's helped me kind of get through the, the past year. Uh, I, I know that I'm going to be more excited to do this race than any other race, and it's going to be an extremely positive energy. I mean, I think we're all going to be, you know, a little freaked out, a little excited. Um, we're all competitors. We'll all have our game face on. And I think there's going to be this, uh, forgive me if this is sappy, but there's going to be a real underlying element of sisterhood in that race, too, that we've achieved this together as a movement and, and you know, as a gender having this race. So we're going to be out there to tear each other's legs off, but also with the utmost respect and pride for what we've been able to, to do in women's cycling. So tell me the big picture. Is this, how much bigger than a bike race is this for you and for the other women? <sighs> It, it's so much bigger. In fact, the, I'm reminded every day when somebody reaches out or contacts me, and they're not even in the sport of cycling, yet they've heard the news of the Tour de France. You know, maybe they saw it in in uh, Glamour magazine or you know a, a newspaper that's not relevant to cycling, but it's made you know an awareness and an impact for people that that the parity of men and women, you know, moving a little bit closer to equality. That's something that the public grasps. So for me, like that tells me that this isn't about bike racing. This isn't even about the Tour de France. This is about something that the world can look to and say, oh my gosh, progress. For you, this being such a monument for you, a monumental effort, an amazing invitation to turn pro with Wiggle Honda, where do you go personally? Do you keep racing? Do you stop after this one race? What do you do? Well, I, I never stop. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I rarely ever stop. But um, I am really excited to let that answer unfold. Um, there have been a lot, of, a lot of life changes and crazy things that have happened this year. So I think I need to kind of sit back and see where the journey is going to take me instead of me trying to force everything, which is <laughs> unfortunately what I usually do. So I'm going to try a new tactic. And I already know that, you know, um, my racing is actually the strongest it's ever been. So if that continues to progress, then I will keep racing. And uh, if that declines, then I will, you know, just try to rule the world or something. So <laughs> we'll see. Will we continue to see you at the forefront of advocating and maybe agitating a little mm -hmm. for women's equality and women's racing. Absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully not just in cycling, but in all sports, because that's one thing that how we're all interconnected is when one women's sport moves forward, all of women's sport moves forward. So if I can have any role in that big picture moving forward, then that's where I want to be. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Todd.